welcome. Hello to everybody. Uh, thanks for being here for uh, WHYY, Fox, and the Ivory Tower. Is media coverage of politics helping or hurting our democracy? My name is Anita Foman, and I'm from the Department of Communication Studies at Westchester University. And I'm pleased to say that Westchester University and Widener University are sponsoring uh, this event this morning, and I'm just here to kick things off. Uh, I want to say that WHYY is currently running a campaign that asks people if they remember their first time. And of course, they mean the first time that you listened to public radio. <laughs> and I so specifically remember more than 30 years ago, standing in the room of a friend, and he said to me, listen to this woman on the radio. She interviews people, and she is so smart. And that was Terry Gross. And more than 30 years ago, I am still enjoying listening to her interviews. And I can add to that that today I'm now listening to the commentary, the verbal commentary, of Chris Satullo, who is the vice pre let me say this correctly, who is the vice president of news and civic dialogue at WHYY. And when I listen to his commentary, I always know that I'm listening to somebody who's a seasoned reporter to somebody who brings his personal experience and his integrity to each uh, presentation that he makes, and it's really a joy to hear on the radio. So uh, after 30 years before, since my first time, I'm happy to say that the relationship is still wonderful and strong. So what I want to do is turn this over to Chris Satullo so he can say, talk about his work and this panel. And I want to let people know that they will be able to ask questions of the panelists after the moderator has asked questions. And you can also um, pre-submit questions by writing them on the cards that are at your tables. And you're also encouraged to tweet throughout the session. So I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Satullo. And thanks for being here. Enjoy the morning. Thank you, Anita, for that very kind introduction. Your mug is in the mail. In fact, we might send an umbrella as well. Uh, thank you very much. It's great to be here, um, and it's uh, an honor to be here with a uh, panel that has this much intellectual firepower. So uh, our plan for the day, as Anita mentioned, is uh, I'll pose a few questions to the panel generally first, and then a couple directed in, in, at individuals on the panel sort of based on their scholarship or background, and then we'll go to the questions from the audience. So let me introduce the panel, um, going, starting here and going down. Um, Dr. John Gastel is a professor of communication arts and sciences and political science at Penn State, where he also directs the McCourtney Institute for Democracy. He specializes in political de deliberation and group decision making, particularly within small groups of lay citizens. Uh, he's done work in Oregon with the Citizens Initiative Review and has done a great deal of study of the jury as a, uh, a tool of democracy. His books include The Jury and Democracy, The Group and Society, Political Communication and Deliberation, and By Popular Demand, Revitali Revitalizing Representative Democracy. And he was recently, I would mention, um, featured in a story on WHYY. Uh, you probably all know Dr. Kathleen Hall Jamison, who is the Elizabeth Ware Packard Professor at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, where she was formerly dean. And she's the director of its Annenberg Public Policy Center. She's a fellow of the American Philosophical Society, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and every other organization that is worth <laughs> belonging to in the area of political science. Um, five over 16 uh, singular co-authored books have received political science or communication awards. And her book on the 2008 election, The Obama Victory, received the 2010 American Publishers Association Prose Award as the best book about government and politics. Great. Stephen Janis is an award-winning investigative journalist whose work has won acclaim in both print and television. As senior investigative reporter for the Baltimore Examiner, he won two Maryland, D.C., Delaware Press Association awards for his work on unsolved murders in Baltimore and the killings of prostitutes. As an investigative producer for WBFF, Fox 45, he won three successful Capitol Emmys for Best Investigative Series and Best Cultural Historical Feature. Uh, he has written two books with two former homicide detectives called Why Do We Kill? The Pathology of Murder in Baltimore 
and you can't stop murder, truths about policing in Baltimore and beyond. I look forward to talking to him about cereal after the panel. <laughs> Dr. Richard Vatz is a tenured full professor of rhetoric and communication at Towson University. He won Towson University's President's Award for Distinguished Service, the university's highest honor in 2004. He's also won the first Towson Student Government Association Faculty Member of the Year Award. He's also won six outstanding teaching awards from Towson. He's published a book on persuasion called The Only Authentic <laughs> Book of Persuasion. I know I am persuaded by that title. So please uh, welcome all of our panelists. So let me uh, throw a first question out, and I think we'll start in that, um, answering it in the order of, that we just introduced folks. But enormous changes in media and in political journalism recently just in terms of format. But as you look at the landscape, um, what are, in your view, the enduring obligations of, I'll, I'll call it text and uh, electronic journalism, respectively, in terms of providing information so that we can have an informed citizenry and, and electorate, and in your view, how well is either side, either text journalism or called digital journal, journalism or broadcast journalism doing the job? Dr. Gastel. Sure. Uh, when I think about the media, I like to think about the media system as opposed to a particular source like a blog or a paper. And the reason I like to think about the system is in terms of uh, the media's role in relation to the public and the things the public must do in terms of weighing issues and choosing leaders and, and actually voting directly on legislation often, the role of the media is to help facilitate a kind of macro level society-wide deliberation. The reason I emphasize the system as opposed to individual outlets is we can get caught up in saying, well, these electronic sources have this particular responsibility. The print sources have that particular responsibility. And I, I would really rather say, what is the aggregate responsibility? In the aggregate, what they're supposed to do is help us bring issues onto the agenda, become aware of things we may not have thought about, maybe uncomfortable questions and topics. Once they're into our consciousness, they need to help us weigh alternatives to those issues, maybe even identify alternatives, and really reflect on the values uh, that we have and others have, and kind of move us toward uh, a better decision making. So when I think about print versus electronic in that context, I am comfortable saying that print, if it's to maintain its relevance, it really should specialize on depth and insight, and electronic obviously will always have the edge on timeliness. Um, but again, the, there's, the interplay of those is so extreme that a print source, its most relevant footprint in the world today is electronic. Um, so really, it's a difference of, of specialization across sources. And as long as that adds up to something good, uh, then the obligations are met. But they almost never are. Kathleen Altunas. The, the function of journalism that holds those in power accountable can be better discharged in an environment in which we've got both the best of the old and the best of the new. The challenge in this new environment isn't that journalism doesn't have those capacities, it does, but that the capacity to manipulate and deceive has now advanced more rapidly than those capacities to detect and hold accountable. The advent of micro-targeting, which at some point will make it possible for a television advertiser advancing a political cause to address an ad to your particular interest, having profiled you, and not to address it to your spouse who is on the computer in the other room, means that when accountability journalism comes into the fore, it has to find that content, and it has great difficulty. We have more accountability journalism now than we have ever had. We've got more fact-checking journalism, specifically tasked to do fact-checking than ever before, and it is less able than it has been in the past to perform that function because the technologies of deliverance and manipulation have outstripped its capacity to detect. Um, you know, that's an excellent point about uh, accountability journalism because basically as a journalist who has been through probably four separate entities in the past five years or six years I've had, I worked at a newspaper that folded, a website that folded, a television station that I had to leave, and now I'm at a nonprofit. So that uh, challenge of being able to find some sort of stable way to distribute information 
uh, creates a, a very difficult situation for sustainability. Without sustainability and without some sort of fiscal sustainability, it makes it uh, very difficult to sort of create this watchdog culture because I see, at least in terms of journalism, in, in terms of trying to formulate some sort of business model, that there is a, sort of a bias towards opinion and a bias towards just being biased, which tends to make it tends to tends to make it more feasible in terms of the conduits like Facebook and the places that really are distributing news now, but tend to work or be somewhat antithetical to the idea of accountability. And so I think the what's really incumbent upon journalists in, in the digital age is honestly to work out some sort of balance between that idea of understanding complexity and being able to hold people accountable but at the same time find a working model that's sustainable. And I think in a certain way that those two are conflicting, and I'll talk about that more later, but I really think you're right about that, that the, the watchdog role has to be somehow reconciled with the means of production and communication that are really changing the fiscal landscape of journalism now. I think that print has the obligation to be more thorough and to include different voices in its opinion page. But much of electronic journalism has to conform to, if it bleeds, it leads philosophy and is prey to sensationalism. But basically, I think that the critical questions between, between print and electronic journalism are overcome by the obligations they have on agenda and spin. One expression or credo to which many newspapers adhere and the Nation magazine explicitly praises is that a journalist's job is to comfort the, afflict, the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. This is indicative of a prevailing media bias, which explains much of the slant of progressive news, in my opinion. It's a charge and an agenda which is inconsistent with disinterested journalism. Disinterested journalism, disinterested media coverage of politics entails journalists revealing no agenda, no spin, and no preference for a given political position. To the extent that print and or electronic journalism emphasize their own agenda and emphasize a particular spin in a position, I think compromises the value of that journalism. Okay, uh, let me, uh, let's just stay with this topic for a minute. Um, and as someone who, like uh, Stephen, has moved from for-profit commercial media to nonprofit, although having left the Inquirer, I always say I left an unintentional nonprofit to go to an intentional <laughs> nonprofit. <laughs> <laughs> um, how does, uh, th there's a real effort, certainly in this city, uh, you know, funded uh, to a large degree by the Wincoat and William Penn Foundations, to create a robust nonprofit public interest journalism sector. Um, how does, in this current environment, with, you know, all, uh, you know, as volatile as things are in terms of platform and delivery, do you see any potential for the idea that a nonprofit model of journalism can actually take root and do some of what you're looking for, even if the commercial for-profit um, model is maybe beyond hope? Do you want me to start? Sure. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, Since we've fought these wars well, for a while. Well, you know, it, it, having, yes, I think, I think nonprofit could, could actually fill a, a huge void. I mean, part of the problem is the economics of internet news, uh, it doesn't really sort of align with the type of reporting it takes to do complex investigations, some of the things that are supposed to be, I would guess, the best aspects of journalism. I mean, you, what you get paid for a thousand impressions barely, you know, will buy you a pencil. So I, the commercial model that existed before, which wasn't really bad, having thousands of disinterested advertisers support journalism needs to be somehow modified or replaced. Uh, and nonprofit is not a bad situation. I think the only problem is, conversely, you might have three or four people initially funding. Like in our organization, I don't know everyone who funds us, but we have some big backers, and and people don't fund things for without a reason. I mean, they fund them because they have a, an agenda, and, and it all becomes a matter of agenda. When you have advertising model, you have a diffuse agenda. I think some of the issues with nonprofit is you have a concentrated agenda, and of course, uh, you know, the idea of sort of translating what a successful public radio station does for a news organization, let's say you want to have 100 donors or 1,000 donors, I think you get into the realm of, of bias because bias is what sells and what makes people uh, donate to, um, to nonprofits. So it's, it's tricky, 
But I do think it's not a bad model because we have to try something. And, and having been in a website that really couldn't make it work, where we did good investigative journalism, I think, I think it's worth trying to see what happens. You know. mm -hmm. Kathleen? Yeah, the, on, on most days when I wake up, I don't think of myself as running a small news organization. But factcheck.org is nonprofit journalism. And the model there is a model that I think the academic community ought to explore at greater length and in more depth. To the extent that we have expertise in many areas and students who need, as in order to be functioning adults in society, to be able to communicate well, I think we ought to look at whether or not we can harness the capacities of universities to create more nonprofit journalism that translates out the expertise inside our departments and across our departments into a world that increasingly can't afford the depth of a beat structure so that the for-profits and the other non-for-profits who are doing wide-ranging journalism can draw on an already established synthesis that we have offered, preferably communicated in intelligible English. It's that last part that's going to pose the challenge to the academy, not finding a way to fund this. We are already essentially funding it. We are just now disseminating our insights out through journals that nobody reads, written in a language that's virtually indecipherable to the larger community that would like to relay what it is we know to a broader public. I, I think there was an applause coming there, Kathleen. I just, <laughs> uh, no, I'm sorry. That was for me. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, no, I, I, I think that's a great point. I, I, I do think it's tricky, right, figuring out how the university creates that apparatus without it becoming captive of its own public relations purposes. But I think it could be done. If anywhere it could be done, it could be done there. But I just want to put a word in for the idea of actually publicly funding uh, uh, all kinds of things, not just public broadcasting, but community radio as well, I think is a really important niche. Stations like WORT in, in Madison, Wisconsin, unfortunately are, are relatively rare. Um, but I, I love the idea of concentrating public support, meaning through public revenue, and then redistributing through you know, Corporation for Public Broadcasting and so on, into all these sort of quasi-independent entities that have real local identities, that aren't just a wonderful national program voiced by Ira Glass, but are real local volunteers in community radio often, people producing local news and media. So I, I think the challenge there is getting the public to the point that it's so committed to that that they think that's a necessary function of our public monies. I think everybody is always interested in having uh, pure, uh, less biased uh, information available. But to what end? I mean, the fact is, is that most people go to their, their ideological predilections. People who are on the right watch Fox every night. People on the left watch, excuse me, NBC every night. So I, I, think, that, I think that we always hear of these, these great panaceas for people getting biased information but they never have much effect. Let me, let me give one, just one example of one of, the, one of the finest columns, I think, in Washington. The Washington Post has a fact-checking column by Glenn Kessler. And I, I do not believe that I ever hear uh, liberals quote his points where uh, liberals have been unfair. And I don't think I've ever heard conservatives quote his points where conservatives have been unfair. And I don't think they ever become part of the the uh, national conversation to change people's votes. In other words, people look for the evidence that supports their opinion. So I, I, think, that, I think it's nice to have uh, better, more disinterested uh, news uh, and available information, but I don't think there's much consequence. And I think people will, will continue to go toward their ideological preferences for their information. Yes, Kathy. But, but let me speak to something that's really in John's bay look more so than mine. Unless you have a consensual basis for a dialogue that is agreed upon and there's a relationship between it and the external world, you're not going to have intelligent public deliberation about the problems and solutions that we need. And as a result, simply accepting the fact that there's going to be bias in journalism and we're as a result going to roll over and play dead because of inevitable confirmation bias 
says that we're not going to fight to hold that kind of ground that lets us be a deliberating community that ultimately is able to say, yes, by these points of definition, this is a problem. We will grant that it is a problem. Now let's look at alternative solutions. Based on what we know about them, here is how they would work or have worked in practice. As a result, leaders, we are willing to accept this as an alternative and perhaps be taxed for it or at least see our revenues be used for it. And so I worry when the academic community looks as if it says, well, everything's going to be biased inevitably because the public's incapable of processing what is left, and as a result, we can't create a demand structure to create it. If we don't have the demand structure that puts it in place, we're not going to have a government that's going to work. Yeah. Uh, okay, <clears throat> if, I'm, if I'm allowed in my role as moderator, uh, Professor Retz, let me challenge you a little bit because I actually disagree with what you just said. All right. Um, and this gets to another one of the questions we wanted to talk about, like what actually constitutes bias and the difference in journalism between having an opinion personally and being biased. Every living human being has an opinion about things. The entire point of being a journalist <laughs> is to be more conscious than the average bear um, of what your opinions are and how it could affect your... your uh, um, execution of your professional duties in being hypervigilant, particularly where you are most opinionated. I spent my entire life in newsrooms. I've worked with hundreds of people who do that very effectively, and I've worked with uh, far too many people who don't do it all that effectively. So, you know, there's, there's no blanket statements. But um, I just wonder whether, you know, I'm, I guess I'm with D uh, Dean Jameson, um, whether this is inevitable or this situation that you're describing is actually the result of a concerted 30-year program, very effective narrative by people who weren't happy with the kind of things the New York Times were doing to basically poison the wells and to basically make the case you just made that it's impossible to have um, fair-minded, accurate journalism because everybody is biased and to sort of create a situation where everybody's going to their private watering hole and getting their biases confirmed. But is that inevitable or is that the product of an effort to create that situation? Let me, let me answer your question by focusing on one of a trillion uh, possible situations that, that strikes me to answer your question. Mitt Romney, in, a, in the 2012 debate with Texas Governor Rick Perry and a couple others, was accused of supporting individual mandates in health insurance. And he said that he actually did not support that. And Rick Perry said, yes, you did. I, it's, it's, right, it's right in your book. And Mitt Romney, and Mitt Romney said, I'll bet you $10,000 you're incorrect. Chuck Todd, a completely disinterested uh, journalist, jumped on this and went ballistic saying that this showed Mitt Romney's insensitivity to people who are having financial troubles. And this became the story for days and days and days, and actually throughout the election. Now, what does one make of this? Does one say that, does one say that this, is, this is media bias? Does one say that, he, that his agenda, being the fact that Mitt Romney, clumsily he claimed, bet $10,000 when people can't afford to bet $10,000? There was no focus on the issue. There was just a focus on the fact that Mitt Romney had a hypothetical bet of $10,000, which parenthetically was refused by Rick Perry. Now, tell me, tell me what you think of that kind of journalism. Tell me, does that represent, when we get down to real particulars, maybe we disagree. Does that represent perspicacious journalism of somebody actually seeing a, a, an important part of the election agenda that he needed to make salient? I don't think so. I think that this was, this was the rhetoric of Chuck Todd, and this is what you get, and all journalism is like this, and it will be forever thus. If I can jump in, uh, I, there's a wonderful book by a political scientist named Sam Popkin called The Reasoning Voter, and uh, I disagree with him on lots of things, uh, but I, I was absolutely sold on this insight. Uh, the example he gives, it's not the $10,000, it's much older than that. He gives lots of examples, but absolute favorite one is this is Gerald Ford is at an event, I believe in Texas, uh, celebrating Latino culture, and he's trying to demonstrate to the voters that he is very supportive of and understanding of Latino culture, something that the empirical record might have disputed to that point. Um, when he's sitting at the, at the event, 
he begins to eat a tamale. And if you're familiar with a tamale, that's a delicious uh, cornmeal surrounding whatever the heck you put in there, it's still good. Uh, and then a, a, a corn husk is what it's actually steamed in. Uh, so you know what's going to happen here. Ford is trying his darndest to chew through that husk. Uh, he can't cut through it. He doesn't, hit, doesn't have any idea what a tamale is. That became a big part of the story. And Popkin's point was, that's a great story. Because it is so hard to get real sort of accidental facts and truths into the stream of coverage in an election. And I, I appreciate that we do need to talk about the issues. We want to know what your platform is and so on. But there are moments of sort of unvarnished character uh, that come up in an election that, that just tell you something. Right? And yes, they're subject to interpretation. And yes, you feel sorry for Gerald Ford with his tamale. Uh, but the fact is, sometimes candidates get caught trying to present themselves as a person with a history that they really don't have. So I, I stand in defense of those situations where the actual fact happened, uh, the George Bush scanning the socks thing, it turns out, is actually not quite what it seemed to be. So there are times they're misrepresented. But when it actually happens, it actually gives us insight uh, and that matters to voters who are trying to make a judgment in these cases, not just about the positions of a party someone stands with, but the actual character of the person who will be called upon to make a, a million judgments, large and small, in the most challenging job in the world. I think, can I just, just sorry, did you want no, to? No, go oh, ahead. Okay. Uh, from my perspective, bias is sort of the, um, it's like the new object in journalism in terms of it, it has become sort of the way, the loss leader, the way to attract people to the stream of the way news is encountered by consumers. And in my entire experience as a journalist, and some of my most difficult stories, uh, to, to think that we haven't worked in newsrooms that are suffused with bias and that there are politics that intercede, it's just, it doesn't happen. I, I've never been in a situation where I've been able to sort of report a controversial story without, you know, without having to weigh into things that are uncomfortable and, and where objectivity is, is not always uh, ruling the day. But, but I think that we have to take into account that it's not impossible for good journalism or objective journalism occur within a place that has some sort of bias. I mean, we have newspapers that have opinion and they have you know, reporting and they're separate, but I'm, I mean, anybody who's in a newsroom and, and says there's just a bunch of objective people sitting around without strong opinions or have worked in a newsroom that doesn't have a, some sort of patronage that tells, that tries to dictate your coverage is, I don't think you know, it's completely being transparent. So I think we have to think about bias as something that works within, you know, when you look at your Facebook feed, what are you going to read? And how are you going to encounter this media organization? And why are people going to support it if they don't feel it has some sort of identity politics going on with it? I don't think it's practical. You know? I mean that, and that's purely from saying that we have to recognize the marketplace and, and, and that the marketplace doesn't really pay attention sometimes to the good journalism that we want to do. Um, just adding that. Let me, let me add to that. These, these little slice of life uh, revelations are selected revelations. You may learn something small about somebody. You may not learn about how philanthropic Mitt Romney was if it's not covered during the 2012 presidential election. And, and some, of, some of this stuff is, is made salient. Some of it's ignored. Uh, when, um, when Joe Biden said to uh, Barack Obama, you are the first mainstream African American who is articulate and bright and clean. Mm. What an outrageous remark. How much was that covered? Lot, well, it was, co it was covered a lot, it was covered a lot and covered disparagingly by conservative media. It was not covered a lot and disparaging by progressive media. But you could have, you could have said, now, now, I don't happen to believe, I do not believe that that tells you a lot about Joe Biden. I believe there are thousands, uh, Joe Biden, there are millions million stories, but <laughs> there, are, there are many, many stories about Joe Biden. And I, I kind of find him a likable guy. But you could depict him through one or two slice of life stories that you claim are relevant to his candidacy and depict him any way you want. I think what we always have to remember is that all of these issues are selected and they're selected very often with some ideological consistency by many media. Yeah, two, two quick pieces of, of social science data. The, the tactical strategy structure in press is deeply embedded. And when it's activated, it activates cynicism and depresses learning. We know that through over a million dollars of experimentation and published in a book called Spiral of Cynicism. But 
the public doesn't inevitably, these are two discrete pieces, the public doesn't inevitably act on its ideological biases, nor do journalists. There are norms in place that journalists use to try to fight those biases. And those norms are reflected in coverage norms that are deeply embedded in mainstream journalistic structures. But the public doesn't automatically default to confirmation bias either. There is such a thing as identity priming. And we are in some moments primed as an ident for identity as partisans and sometimes not. We've shown this experimentally when we expose individuals who are conservatives to a Fox News story that features Arctic sea ice pictures from NASA from 2012 and 2013. There was an unexpected rebound in Arctic sea ice in 2013. Fox only shows the two images and doesn't show the long-term trend, which continues to be a downward trend. Conservatives would be disposed to believe there is no downward trend, hence confirmation bias should say they accept this as selective use of evidence. We can put those conservatives in a communication structure in which we prime their identity as seekers of information and present them with the information about the downward trend in which they are asked questions about what did Arctic sea ice look like in this year and this year and this year and when they come to realize that the six lowest points have happened within the seven last years, they accept the conclusion that there is a downward trend even in the face of that exposure which tells you you can prime an identity as information seeker. We need to figure out how we do more of that within our news structures. Uh, I'm glad you brought up the climate change issue because that was the next uh, question I was going to ask you with, in the context of this discussion of bias or accusations of um, distorted coverage. If you if you were one of the, those um, um, hardy, old-fashioned, grizzled journalists who were still trying to um, navigate somewhere down the middle um, and be fair to both sides, how would you um, recommend covering the climate change issue? Because um, when you do a standard sort of Associated Press down the middle story and give equal space and credence to those who deny climate change and those who don't, you hear from many scientists who cover it, like why are you giving these people um, who don't know what they're talking about equal credence? And when you don't do this, you hear frequently from conservatives who say, why are you buying this climate change hoax? How do you recommend that people navigate a situation where um, one political party um, seems to have embraced a counterfactual position. Well, there's two different stories you could be writing. Mm -hmm. If you're writing a story about uh, political uh, parties and their positions and disagreements on climate change and policies related to climate change, you have at least two major party point of view. That is, you're actually reporting on science and scientific information. Um, if you believe there are two sides to this debate you must cover, I would encourage you to recognize that parapsychology has many people publishing in a journal on that subject, doing rigorous research showing that you can have telekinetic abilities. I just cracked my glass on the table. You can inspect it yourself. I did that just now with my mind. <laughs> well, if you're not covering me, you're, you're obviously biased and you're part of the American Psychological Association establishment. It, it just becomes ridiculous. I mean, people, there really is a flat earth society. Those aren't people kidding around. They should be. But the point is that, that there are things called scientific consensus. That doesn't literally mean that every scientist agrees, but it means there's a broad understanding. We have academies of science and so on that help establish these things. So if you're doing science journalism, you are not talking about the other side because there is not in a meaningful sense such a thing. If you're doing a very minute story on some part of the issue, uh, it's there. I mean. So, so that's a, this is a real problem. Of okay, let, let, let me press you a little bit Please. on this. Um, the things are not distinct, right? Science journal, journalism, political journalism. If Congress has a cap and trade emissions bill in front of it, the question, the policy question, is essentially, I mean, there is a political question there. How will they vote? But it hinges on the science. So, and that's where it gets interesting that you have to somehow bring the world of, 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 of fact and science and data into a place inside the Beltway in Washington, D.C., where it rarely flourishes. So well, that's I, the issue. And I'll, I'll disagree with you strongly there. Science flourishes in policy environments. We pay attention to the hard cases where there has become a cultural or political polarization surrounding a scientific issue. But I'll give you vaccination, right? 
There was an attempt to make that into this you know, huge debate, and, and some Republican presidential candidates tripped over themselves thinking they had to go into a space where the public did not want to go, and the science can't take them, right? And we're not there. So time and again, science is powerfully informing public policy. There's even cases where social science is powerfully informing public policy. So it's a question of whether political elites recognize an opportunity to create wedges and divisions and so on, or where genuinely the science or the social science more commonly actually really is divided. Those are interesting, complex policy arenas. But again, we overgeneralize from these extreme and, and terribly difficult cases in the United States, like climate change, an issue that in most countries around the world, there is no controversy over the science and the policy can move forward in a relatively straightforward way, disagreeing about policy consequences. So therefore what? The issue here is journalism not global warming. The question is, what should journalists do with this issue? I happen to believe in global warming. I happen to believe in the conventional points of view of global warming, but that doesn't seem to be, to be part of our agenda here. We're talking about how this is covered. And it does not seem to me that it should be the purview on news pages for journalists to adjudicate disputes between scientists who claim that global warming is man-made, global warming is not man-made. I don't know many people who really dispute global warming, but it, doesn't, but it seems to me that the role of the journalist is not to adjudicate these disputes, it's to describe these disputes, to, to describe whether in journals, in higher journals or lower journals or more impressive journals, X position is taken or Y position is taken. It is, is on the op-ed pages, on the editorial pages that these opinions should be, should be flurry, flourishing. Uh, so I don't view the job of journalists to adjudicate the great questions of our time. I think sometimes journalism is too downstream in a debate and forgets that there are presuppositions inside the debate. When one talks about legislation about cap and trade, one is debating an alternative means of dealing with carbon in the atmosphere. Sometimes journalism forgets to tell us that there is scientific agreement because of a basic understanding of how chemistry works, that when you put carbon into the atmosphere, you get these kinds of effects. People don't dispute that when you put carbon into the atmosphere, you get these kinds of effects. They dispute whether or not carbon in the atmosphere is sufficient to produce the level of effects that are there and what the alternative things are that might be producing the effects that we see. Sometimes if we step back and say, what is the presupposition of the debate? Is carbon in the atmosphere good or bad? People would say, in general, it is not good to put carbon into the atmosphere. The question is, what is our alternative, and what are the alternatives to deal with it? If we phrase it that way and say that's the presupposition, then you can say cap and trade is a means of addressing carbon. What are the alternative means of addressing carbon? Those who say they don't want this means of addressing carbon should be asking then, since they've granted us in this early distinction that it is bad, what are the alternatives? And they may say such things as have more volcanoes that spew more ash into the air because that would actually solve the problem. Or they could say we want more nuclear, or they could say we want more solar, or they could say we're going to engage in capture and sequester. Any of those things then is subject to debate about whether it will address carbon in the atmosphere. So sometimes we forget in journalism, I think, what the downstream implications are of the upstream understanding. And we don't look at the debate in the moment, carbon cap and trade, in the context of all the other potentials and let the public say which of those is an actual alternative that's viable on the table. So sometimes I think we assume too little and we assume too much in journalism and we don't think that the audience is smart enough if we make those additional moves to, try to follow with us. I actually think part of the problem is that we don't respect the audience enough to allow them to understand what the scientists know. And as a result, we report there's a scientific consensus but we don't explain what that is and how they got there. Well, that's an appeal to authority, and you know, I viscerally don't like appeals <laughs> to authority. I'd like to understand how they got to, as best they can get me there. I don't expect them to make me a scientist, but as best they can get me there. And you know, I can understand what carbon does in the atmosphere, you just have to walk me through it. Uh, I mean, I would just say that uh, I, I somewhat agree with Dr. Vatz to a certain extent because I'm not really sure why journalism is expected to when you have, it sort of belies the whole idea of the internet where you can look something up and get a variety of opinions. I mean, and you, the information is all pretty much there and evident. And it, 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 this whole idea kind of strikes me as the debate about what journalism should be in the future. Because given the fact that 
we're supposed to have a, a wealth of access. Why is it suddenly the responsibility solely of journalists to mediate? I don't know if the word would be mediate. And I'm getting really out of my realm of expertise, but <laughs> um, I'm always I'm always stunned by this because there is this, still this residual sense that journalists are supposed to do this work, but there is no residual marketplace that supports a lot of this work in, in the way that it used to. And I'm kind of, tr so, you know, when we discuss this, we discuss bias or bad reporting or poor reporting, I'm like, well, how is this, where is this supposed to work? On what level? On what level are we supposed to have 100 environmental reporters who will have a beat where they could really understand the complexity of these issues? I mean, complexity comes from on the ground reporting, nothing else. It doesn't come from internet searches or anything. All of that comes from on the ground reporting. How is this supposed to be supported? Where are these wonderful, uh, journalists with all these resources and time, where are they supposed to come from? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, because I worked for a website for two and a half years and barely got paid. And uh, my salary hasn't gone up in seven or eight years. So where exactly is this supposed to happen? Uh, maybe it happens inside academic institutions. Maybe that's where all the money is. But if you're going to, you know, indict journalism for not doing a job, then you have to have a structure for which it can exist where people like me can do that kind of work. And I just find it, you know, strange. But anyway, that's my point. Yeah, yeah, there, there is, however, a different type of bias. Once the journalistic community accepts that there is a scientific consensus, the question is, is it capable of seeing evidence that runs counter to the scientific consensus? And so one of the questions right now for those covering climate change is, because those who are on the other side of the climate debate are saying there hasn't been the level of warming that we would have expected given the climate models. And they're not fundamentally wrong about that. We would have expected, given the climate models, because we're increasing the amount of carbon that's going into the air, that you'd have the temperature increasing, not necessarily with, not without variance. There would be variance, but it would be continuing to climb. And for the last 15 years, there hasn't been the level of increase you otherwise would have permitted, otherwise would have expected. Now, will the journalists who have accepted the fact that there's consensus cover the fact that there's something science is still trying to explain, and it is, because the scientists know very well that that is potentially running counter to their models. They're still, apology for the being technical, they're still within the confidence intervals of their model projection, but they're on the low end of the confidence intervals of the model projection, where they really ought to be into the center of those confidence levels across time as you project out the trends. Now, journalism that has accepted the consensus and may not understand the underlying science and be following it as closely as it should, doesn't come into this debate holding the scientific community as accountable as it ought to when the scientific community announces in the form of a NASA and NOAA press release that 2014 was the warmest year on record. It wasn't. By NASA and NOAA's own data, it wasn't. It was likely the warmest year, it was probably the warmest year, but it was not incontrovertibly the warmest year because it was in the margin of error of the warmest year against 2005 and 2010. Now, does journalism then cover that as a problem for the scientific community because they said warmest year when it actually wasn't? Or does it buy the consensus and say, no, no, our job is not to feature this? Well, when it doesn't hold the scientific community accountable, it's not engaging in its accountability function as surely as it's not when it fails to hold those others who engage in manipulation accountable. Uh, John, I, want to go, I just want to respond to something Kathleen or, or build on something Kathleen said. Um, you know, I run a project on energy and environment which is very much involved with climate change. One of our reporters on that project just spent a year at MIT studying climate change and has done um, did for us a story talking to many of the scientists she met during that year saying, why don't you ever say to the press when they call you for comment the things that I learned in that year? And they basically said, because we trust neither the press nor the public to understand the nuances of what we're talking about. Yeah. 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 I, I just want to echo something Dr. Janice was saying just a second ago, which is I, what I don't want us to do is to fall into scolding the media for not doing the things that its system is not built to do. That is, you kept saying, you know, where is the, where is the funding for that kind of reporting? How are, what's, your, what's your business model for that? And I think that's the right question. And that's why I keep stressing, I do think there is a, a very large role potentially for public financing of this kind of reporting. Again, in the way I, I talked about with block grants and so on. So I, I do think that's the right question. And we've got to take seriously what the current economic system our media is built in is capable of doing in terms of return to shareholders and, and all that. If we think that there should be some alternative space for not-for-profits, sure, but it's only going to be so large. So again, I think it's got to bring us back to not just, you know, who's naughty and who's nice, but what kind of a system have we built and what honestly should we expect from it? 
Okay, well, thanks very much for that rousing discussion. Now we're going to go to a part where we have questions directed at individual mem members of the panel. Um, and I invite others to jump in after um, the person to whom the question is addressed gets a chance to talk. Uh, Dr. Gessler, we'll go to you first. Um, and I'm, I'm gonna sort of modify this question slightly based on our discussion, but the, the question is, uh, in your experience, and you've worked with a number of voters at ground level trying to do deliberative democracy, do the voters you're familiar with or you've studied actually want neutral information, or do they have they given up on such a thing that exists? And um, I guess the, the supplement would be, in your view of how deliberative democracy could and ought to work, would that be a real impediment if people cease to believe in neutral information? Yeah, if, if people cease to believe that there is such a thing as neutral information, we're, th this project is in deep trouble, this project of self-government. Um, and I, I'd make a quick distinction between deliberative democracy as a systemic level practice, is something we aspire to. We, uh, we want to live in a deliberative democracy. Uh, and then there's instances of democratic deliberation, which are relatively localized, specific things. And my, my research tends to look at the latter, though in service of the, the former. Um, and so let me give you an example of this kind of thing. When Kathleen was saying before uh, that you know, people can become information seeking or they can get into that mode or they can go into the opposite mode, uh, it, it put yourself in this situation. In the state of Oregon, by law now, when they hold initiative elections, they have a commission made up mostly of citizens who choose a couple issues that are gonna be on the ballot that year that need to be studied carefully by a randomly selected body of citizens. Imagine that you're randomly selected and you show up uh, at the convention center and you have a week to study Initiative 73. Now for that whole week, you and your fellow citizens, about two dozen of you, are gonna look at that issue. You're gonna hear from people on both sides. You're maybe gonna hear from some neutral background witnesses and your job is to produce a single sheet of paper that breaks that issue down. What are the key things you need to know about it? What are really the best arguments for and against Measure 73? That sheet of paper will then go into the voter's guide that is mailed to every household in your state that has a registered voter. Now, in that role, lay citizens, people from all kinds of backgrounds, varying knowledge levels and so on, are, are, they are incredible. Uh, they, actually, they, they often don't find out each other's political points of view. Um, they just don't find it terribly relevant to the task put before them. When they talk about what they're doing, they talk about what information the voters will need. They, they translate that page. They're, they're, I had never thought of this, but they're in a way like little mini journalists, you know, in that they're trying to gather the news, organize it, and, and transfer it to the public in a way that is extremely useful. Now, who do they transfer it to? They transfer it to a large public that usually behaves in a way that is kind of embarrassing to all of us in terms of how much thought we really put into our votes. But in this situation, our research is finding that Oregon voters often actually want to read that page and really read it. And their knowledge levels go up, they're actually processing information. Now there are biases that come into that and so on, nothing's perfect here, but it's a, an incredible example of a state in this country that kind of believes that people want this information, came up with a way to create it that doesn't, doesn't only produce good information, but pr produces a delivery system that is credible to voters. After all, it's made by fellow voters. So I love instances like that where we see that lay people, not only on the panel, but in that larger public, this is kind of what they want, and they will use it and make more informed votes as a result. Okay, anybody else want to jump in on that? Well, just that, uh, I'll just add, uh, I, I don't think there is such a thing as neutral information. I'm always reminded of the person in the argument who says, and that's a fact. And, and it usually is, but it's not the only fact. There are usually multiple facts that co contradict that fact. And any time you have a, a fact sheet, you have a choice of facts that you're, that you're highlighting and, and, and many facts you're not highlighting. And so it is all rhetoric. I don't use rhetoric pejoratively there. I'm saying it is all choices of fact to highlight, choices of fact to ignore, choices of fact to give more emphasis to, to give less emphasis to, to give a spin to. And it just doesn't exist. This doesn't mean that nobody is reasonable. It just means that any time you're involved in selecting facts for an issue, you're involved in a rhetoric. Some of it may be a, a clearer uh, ideological rhetoric, some may not be. But it, there is no such thing as neutral information. One thing I learned you know, covering crime and on a crime scene, um, and this is just something I learned, is that from subjectivity emerges objectivity, just on the idea of fact that if you go to like really a spectacular crime where a bunch of people are shot, the more people you speak to, 
the more commonality emerges, even though the individual recollection diverge in many details. And that if you talk to every, every iteration, every person you talk to, in addition, things will emerge in commonality and universality of what happened in that event. So I mean, I think there, and that speaks to the idea of complexity, which is probably the overarching concern for me as a journalist, is how do we represent that complexity in, in the context of the current you know, business model? But I'll get to that later, but anyway, so. Mm -hmm. God, I worry about people who think there aren't facts as opposed to people who think there isn't neutral information. Because by, by fact, we don't mean there's an exact correspondence between the word and the thing in some objective way. What we mean is that by a specified definition and a specified methodology, in a specified context, this is the best we are able to know. So our existing mechanisms are certifying this. It doesn't mean that necessarily in an ideal platonic universe it is 100% accurate and real, but it means that we actually have to navigate our lives based on the assumption that it's the best that we've got and try to protect those institutions that certify it. And to the extent that we protect the institutions that certify it, journalism can turn to those institutions and rely on them to certify what is knowable to the best we can know it at this moment, given those kinds of specifications. And that's what I mean when I say we have something that's a fact. It's essentially granted fact within that set of assumptions. The minute we say there's no such thing as that, we make debate virtually impossible. We may as well say, for practical purposes, how many of you viscerally are disposed to this? Raise your hands. How many are viscerally disposed to that? Those of you in the middle, do you want to go one way or another and not debate at all, decide simply based on whatever is left, some sort of visceral affective response to the universe, I don't think we want to go there. May I just uh, stipulate, you were not, I hope Kathleen, implying that I was saying that there, there's no such thing as facts or that that's irrelevant, because I was not saying that. No, it was, it was no, if, if I wanted to imply that, I would have stated it. I, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> Do we all need a timeout, or are we okay? <laughs> We're good. Okay. All right, Kathleen, a, a question for you, and you sort of mentioned it earlier, so I just want to sort of go back and put a pin in this question about this issue of micro-targeting. And, you know, you were, you were talking about fact. Um, you run factcheck.org. Um, in a world where political communication is proceeding across so many platforms, many of them micro-targeted individuals, what kind of complexity does that um, add to the fact-checking enterprise, and does it make it essentially Sisyphean? It makes it very difficult when large amounts of money are put in service of data mining to ensure that those who are creating messages know everything one could possibly want to know about the targeted individual and able to deliver that uh, with all of the strategic capacities at play in the consulting community. And I worry about what that means ultimately for the ability of journalism to detect, but also what it means for our capacity to have a common understanding of what we are doing when we are electing. Because potentially we're creating a fragmented media environment in which you have your own election and I have my own election, as does everyone else in this room, and we don't necessarily have a public election that is dealing with the things that are consequential to the public as a whole, unrefracted through all of those individual and potentially manipulated understandings. And into that come the poor fact checkers, who do not have the resources now to collect most of what is out there in quasi-public space, much less those to collect those kinds of micro-targeted messages. The solution to this, if there is one, is going to be the rise of the empowered citizen journalist. It's going to be the individual who is the object of persuasion capturing the message and feeding it back into some structure that has the ability to communicate to the public at large that this manipulative content is out there. And also, it's going to assume that if that happens, that that structure has enough accessibility to the people who've been manipulated that we can get corrections underlying the message structure. Imagine what would have happened in a Hitlerian kind of scenario if there had been micro-targeting. We've seen what mass communication can do where we could actually watch the mass communication. Imagine what it can do when we are incapable of watching it and monitoring it. I think it is the single biggest challenge that is facing political journalism today. Can I ask you a follow-up? You, you mentioned the, the empowered citizen journalist, but what does, in your view, what does citizen journalist mean? Is a journalist simply someone who writes words or creates videos that other people read or watch, or does 
journalist means something in terms of an approach to fact checking. I mean, I guess that's what I keep coming back to. If we don't believe there is such a thing as somebody who is trained to surmount their personal opinions and biases in pursuit of more accurate and fair-minded information, then there is no such thing as a journalist other than it being a synonym for somebody who publishes on the web. Yeah. The, uh, the reason I use the word citizen journalist is because I would like people to feel empowered when they are uh, the object of persuasion to initiate at least some contact with the world that might be able to do something more with it if they aren't themselves able to because they have a platform. And I don't want these individuals to be replacing what is the traditional journalistic function, but rather the f to feel that they're auxiliaries to it in a very important way, because if they're not, I don't think we're gonna be able to detect these sorts of manipulation. Sure. Yeah, if I can jump in. I, my spouse, Cindy Simmons, teaches uh, journalism students and She'll be the first to tell you it's remarkable how many people still want a degree in journalism given the nature of the job market for journalists. Um, and one of the things she said, many brilliant things. Because uh, it is the most fun you can have while being paid for it. So. Well, but not being paid a lot for it. No. Exactly. <laughs> that's, that's why it has to be a lot of fun. <laughs> one of her many insights is that it may be that uh, journalists are disproportionately liberal, which lots of surveys will show you that themselves ideologically are, are liberal, uh, because no conservative would accept those wages. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'm sure that's testable, but I, I don't think it even needs to be tested. Um, no, I, I don't yeah. laugh. That is absolutely <laughs> true. Yeah. Uh, spoken like a true wounded pocketbook. Um, <laughs> No, seriously, I, the, the serious point I want to make here uh, relates back to this idea of the empowered citizen, stern, citizen journalist. In some ways, journalism schools are preparing a wave of citizen journalists, and whether or not you become a journalist doesn't mean that you can't apply those skills and play a special role. Uh, a little more than a half century ago, we used to talk about something called a two-step flow, which was that the media wasn't consumed by everyone, it was consumed by opinion leaders, and they would pass it on to the general public. In a funny way, things, you know, this is why we never kill theories in social science. Um, now we have this whole social network, right? And we've actually recreated the two-step flow. Anyone who uses Facebook, which is anyone now over the age of 30, because uh, <laughs> Facebook is completely, hopelessly not cool now, um, this is what we use it for. And we have these opinion leaders. They're the ones in your Facebook feed who you haven't unfriended. Um, and they are recirculating to you. But, but the best of them, and most of them don't, uh, but the best of them actually are thinking a little bit like a journalist. And sometimes they're juxtaposing information, they're finding good ways of covering things, and this is where I'm a little bit hopeful. It's about a, a cultural disposition that has to be cultivated carefully. But this idea that the micro-targeting is all-powerful, well, fortunately, the micro-target matches a, a part of the larger social network. And within that node, hopefully, it's not really a node, it's actually a small network within the network, there are citizen journalists who have been targeted in that same way and, by the magic of social networks, actually are connected to the other people targeted in that way. So it is not an insurmountable problem, but it would require a recognition, celebration, and so on of the people in these roles so that they, they get real status from playing that role and playing it with a with the sort of journalistic ethics. Does that make them a journalist in the professional sense of the word? I don't think so, but I think there's a cultural space for this, as you say, empowered citizen journalist in a way that might be particularly well attuned to handling the micro-targeting problem. Okay, a, a question um, for Steve, Steven. Uh, I wanna fact check myself before asking the question. The Baltimore Examiner was a digital news no, operation? No, it was a regular newspaper. It was a regular right? newspaper. Yeah, it was um, 250,000 given away every day. It was like the last great failed experiment in print journalism. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. But you have, you have worked in digital journalism? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I had a, all right. I've done all of them. So the, the, the assumption is, yeah, you've, that you've done all of them. Having so. worked in mm -hmm. legacy media and in, in what apparently was the last romantic yelp of a, of a dead platform. <laughs> it really was. Uh, and now in digital journalism, mm -hmm. um, what are the differences and complexities of moving from legacy media to newer digital yeah. media? And how many of the old standards of craft or professionalism can cross that barrier? Well, you know, I, I think, you know, it's a, it, it, is, it is really, really two separate worlds. I mean, working for a print publication or let's say a television station, you have this sort of sense of time and timing. You know, you have the object itself. You have all the editorial resources focused around 
the creation of this object, and then suddenly you're in this world of the digital world where all those boundaries break down, and you, you, you're lacking that sense of timing. E everything is possible, and at the same time, it seems like nothing is possible because you don't have the resources, and the audience is always sort of flowing in and out. So I think uh, that we would make, you know, I, I think back just from my personal experience. I, I had a website, after the examiner closed, I started a website called Investigative Voice, and I was covering, at the time, tr a lot of instances of police issues, police brutality in Baltimore, um, you know, illegality, committing crimes, and my website kind of got known for that. So I went to um, a nonprofit I won't name to ask for funding to do, because I, I saw a huge crisis coming mm. in, in Baltimore and policing and the public. And I went and I asked for a grant for, um, even though I wasn't a nonprofit, I was going to figure it out somehow, to do this series called Crime and Punishment Reconsider, because I just thought, this is out of kilter, this is going to, really not going to work out. It wasn't working out. And the nonprofit turned all my emails and my stuff over to the police department and started sending me back nasty emails from cops saying that I was an inaccurate reporter because it was so intertwined. And so I think we have to look at the digital world as a world of experimentation. And we can't try to take the same type of uh, you know, standards or whatever and, and apply them to people who are trying to figure this out you know, on some level. Uh, I don't think a citizen journalist is going to do the same amount of work mm -hmm. or have the same amount of accountability yeah. that a person who's getting paid to do it will. I don't think that will ever work. I don't, I've seen people come on the scene in Baltimore and evaporate because it's just too much work for somebody. Mm -hmm. It's hours and hours and hours. So I think we need to sort of for a second say, look, maybe this website is biased or maybe this web, but let's let the marketplace figure out what people want and what people don't want. I, I, I don't, and, and obviously I'm saying this content was a nonprofit, but I do think we have to give people some, rec you know, some space to grow and think about this because really, you know, I notice a lot of the websites that succeed are incredibly biased or are notably liberal or notably conservative, and maybe that's the lost leader that attracts the audience. I don't know, mm -hmm. you know, because I know it didn't work in the, in the, in the formula I had, but I, we did do a very important work about, about this subject that has come to the fore in Baltimore in a way that maybe could have been prevented had there been more journalistic resources that, on the ground that you know, weren't tied into one, someone's political career or other. You know, so I think we need to, to, to sort of open up and say, look, what works, what doesn't, let's try everything. Um, and not try to say, well, you're, you're just an, an existing imitation of the Baltimore Sun, because that's not what you are, and you mm -hmm. never can be. And, and the medium is so different. I mean, and when we talk about accountability, let me tell you something. No one is more accountable than a digital journalist, because when you post something and people don't like, or something is inaccurate, my God, you hear a million things, you get a million comments, people tweeting you, telling you're an idiot. You, you have no more, the system, the ecosystem of accountability to people that follow you is quite harsh. You know, so. Right. Yeah, there's, there's no way to sit there and go, a la Sally Field, they like me, they really like me. Because, right. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, the evidence will be rather Right, people are pretty swift in their yeah. condemnation of whatever they feel you did incorrectly. Right. By the way, just one point. I, I, I am periodically uh, surveying my classes to see how many of them know various columnists and read various newspapers. And I often, I have a class of 75, okay? Uh, let me just give you a couple of examples. I asked how many had heard of, heard of George F. Will. In my class of 75 bright students, trust me, these are bright students, three had claimed to have heard of George F. Will. I asked how many had heard of E.J. Dion. Zero had heard of E.J. Dion. They, they, get their, they don't get their news except digitally, and I ask them you know, where they go, and they'll sometimes go to newspapers for the news. They, they mostly go to the sports pages for their, for their news. Uh, I, and I, you know, I, I, get a lot of, I get a lot of information from various, various sites, and the blogs that are on the left and the blogs that are on the right, I, I don't have a lot of interest in. Uh, and yet, um, I get the Daily Beast every day, and, and I often get news ahead of time, and students claim that they get all their news far before the evening news, and they don't need to read the news. And so you have an entire generation that is really turning its back on traditional sources of news.
So, Professor Batts, in this, in this uh, terrain you're describing, and as before you've said, there's a lot of people who are mostly comfor comfortable in an information silo, or mostly they, mm. they get news and information that confirms uh, their positions. Um, if you, we were to imagine or posit that there was a citizen around a, just a given issue who was truly undecided and um, just wanted to like figure out what was going on with that issue, um, you know, what were both sides, what were the salient facts, um, how would you recommend that person, or, or is it, <laughs> could they do that, or how would you recommend that they proceed, proceed in the current information environment? I'm asked that by students, and I, 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 I recommend uh, certain blog sites. I, I do recommend the Daily Beast, which I, has really become my favorite uh, recently, uh, even though the Howard Kurtz left it. I, I really like Howard Kurtz. Uh, but I tell them to read uh, the Washington Post. I tell them that if they, if they want to read a conservative source that is really excellent journalism that they'll have to pay for, uh, read the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal, in my view, has the most excellent editorials, has the most excellent op-eds, it has the most excellent news reporting of any newspaper in the country. Now it's true, they don't, they don't have many liberals provide op-ed pieces for them. And the Washington Post does have liberals and conservatives. But on the other hand, the Washington Post local columnists are all, are all liberal. Uh, but I love the Washington Post, it reads very well. And the New York Times, especially since they've begun to go after Hillary, I, I enjoy that. Uh, <laughs> so I do, to, I, do tell them to, uh, I do tell them to spread themselves around because the, the mainstream journals are, are, have some good stuff in them. And on the evening news, okay, I assume they're not gonna watch Fox. I tell them there's a difference among ABC, CBS, and NBC. That in my view, the CBS Evening News is the most disinterested, but interested, disinterested source of evening news in the country. I think it has the best reporting, I think it's the most serious. Uh, I have all kinds of problems with NBC, which is just trends left consistently. Uh, David Muir on ABC trends left. Uh, and I, but I really think the CBS Evening News is really a, an excellent source for electronic news. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, when the internet was uh, just becoming hot and people were starting to make good and bad investments in it, um, we talked about uh, selectivity bias, that this was the thing we saw, thought was coming, right? That everyone's going to create their own newspaper, right? The, the, the me web. Uh, and it's true enough that people can tailor various feeds and things in various ways, so their preferred sports team or candidate or party or whatever, more of those stories come up. But what I didn't, don't think we foresaw, or at least I, we didn't generally foresee is that we're actually moving into a much more passive uh, news economy. So w if my students uh, wouldn't come to me and say, where should I turn to? What website should I go to? Increasingly, people don't go to websites. They don't type addresses into the address bar at the top of their screen. They might not even know that it's called that. Um, they go to Google. Google is the most powerful news source that does not produce news. Um, they don't even necessarily go to Google News. They might not even know that's a thing. They go to Google. Where do they go to write their papers? Where do they go to get information? It's not that they're even getting information per se, they're just getting an answer. <laughs> they type in, they don't even type questions anymore. Now, I'm not, I'm not hating on Google, though I do recommend Dave Eggers as the circle, though it's a little too melodramatic, but what do you want, it's fiction. Um, the point is, that we, we've really got to recognize what's happening here. It, it's algorithms, and I'm, I'm not saying the algorithms are evil. They're organized for a particular economic purpose in the long run. Facebook is now more and more algorithmic in terms of what you're seeing in your feed. So it's not even your network that is determining what you see, it's that plus an algorithm. My point is that to the extent that we create destination websites, factcheck and cbsnews.com or, or you know, thenation.com, whatever you want, uh, people don't go there. They, they get there through Google. So we've really got to think about the algorithmic structure of news circulation um, and place less hope in destinations that we want people to go to. Let me, John, let me just quickly offer a fact which will confirm what you just said. Uh, That's called confirmation bias, and yeah. I'm all ears. Yeah, I'm right. all ears. Trust I knew, me. I knew you would just perk up knowing that this fact will confirm your wisdom. 
uh, you know, one of the first things I did when I got to WHO was start a new news site called newsworks.org, shameless plug. And uh, since it was not an established news site with a, what they call a user base from the time when websites were something, were kind of an ongoing experiment in the transformation of digital media that you're talking about. So we've had you know, explosive growth in traffic, but I can tell you that the percentage of people who come to Newsworks by bookmarking the page or typing in a Newsworks URL is about 15%. And um, the vast majority of our traffic comes in through what we call the side door. Um, Google search is still the largest single source, but rapid, rapidly, surging up behind it and in a very close second is Facebook. It is all about figuring out what Facebook is doing. They change the damn algorithm every five minutes to stay ahead of you and to extract more money from you to pay for social promotion ads, but it's all about Facebook. Let me insert a question people. to you. Yeah. Do you know how Google orders its answers? Well, it's every... It's every, responses? I mean, do, you, do you know the order, how it determines the order? Well, it's based on your search history. Everybody gets a different first page based on who, who you are and who they think you are. Well, I, I've, all, I've often learned that when you, when you put in certain items in Google, I don't, I don't, I don't seem to, they don't seem to reflect my biases, but the, the order, uh, I never understand the ordering. You know, and nobody, nobody in my classes goes to page two, page three, page four, page five. They just go to page one. Do this experiment. Sit next to somebody and type exact, you know, on your computer that yeah. you normally use and type in the same search. You will not get the same search results from Google in the same order. They will, they will rank order it based on their sense of what you're interested in. If you've been to Turkey in your life and done a lot of tourism searches about Turkey and you type in Turkey, you know, if you're an American on Thanksgiving Day, you'll get something how to cook the bird. But if you've been to Turkey, those things will come up higher in your results. Before Kathleen jumps in, I have to tell the best joke from a friend of ours who works in search engine optimization. And the joke is, where's the best place to bury a body these days? And it is page two of a Google search. <laughs> <laughs> Slight variation on her follow-up joke is this. Where's the best place to throw the murder weapon? Bing. <laughs> <laughs> Not Yahoo? Okay. <laughs> well, one of the advantages of these places that people go and they take what's there is that if you can get there, you get them. So factcheck.org has you know, roughly 87,000 subscribers. That is, they want us, they get us on a regular basis. What Yahoo posts us up, we go to a million. When USA Today posts us up, we see our numbers go up dramatically. So the question is, you know, to what extent can those kinds of sources mine what is out there and increase access to the forms of journalism that we would like people to? And that's a completely different delivery structure than we're accustomed to. But we have formal partnerships with USA Today and Yahoo, so we've increased the likelihood we're going to be there and we're going to get those hits. Yeah, it's gotten to the point where, I mean, I have a full-time employee, um, fairly well paid by the standards of public radio, whose really only job is to game Facebook. That's all she does for us all day long. So, uh, so we want to move on to questions from the audience, but before we do that, uh, I just want to give you all an opportunity. If there's any like pebble in your shoe or itch in your brain from the conversation we just had, something you were dying to say that I failed to give you an opportunity to say, now would be a great moment. I'd like to bring up an issue which, uh, which fascinates me, which, which is covered by some of the stuff we've talked about. Um, and I, because I take a position that is kind of contrary to my normal ideological position on this. Um, I'm not a big fan of Savannah Guthrie because I think, she's, I think she is on the left and she should be in the middle. But she had a contretemps with, uh, with Rand Paul recently. And she, she said, You've had views on foreign policy in the past that were somewhat unorthodox, but you seem to have changed over the years. You once said Iran was not a threat, now you say it is. You once proposed ending foreign aid to Israel, now you support it, at least for the time being, and you once offered to drastically cut defense spending. At which point, Rand Paul says, I, I, I think I can do an imitation, but I won't. Why don't we let me explain instead of talking over me, okay? Before we go through a litany of things you say I've changed on, why don't you ask me a question? Have I changed my opinion? That would sort of be a better way to approach this interview. Now, 
honestly, I, I mean, it shouldn't surprise you that I normally in these disputes come out on the side of the conservatives. I have no idea what he was getting angry at. I mean, that's, <laughs> that seems to me to be a, a, an eminently reasonable question for her to ask, and yet he, he got angry at her. Now, what I'd, what I'd like to know is, in the audience, when if you're a liberal and you see conservatives being treated unfairly, do you recognize it? If you're conservative and you see liberals being treated unfairly, do you recognize it? In other words, are you able to, are you able to recognize unfairness that attends to your side of, of the ideological uh, divide? That's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer <laughs> it. <laughs> um, I, I suspect if we talked for a long time, we would continue to disagree on some points. Um, but I, I think you know, what you just read speaks or nothing that drives me crazy about political journalism, which is that there's an embedded assumption that changing your mind is a sign of weakness. Oh, yeah. That's, yeah, that's wa it's always waffling. It's not like I discovered new information or I learned, I realized that I was wrong and somebody else's viewpoint made more sense, so I adjusted. It is always considered to be either the result of venality and being paid by someone or weakness of will. I wrote an article on that in the Baltimore Sun. Absolutely. The fact that a person changes his or her mind does not mean that, that gotcha. You know, one assumes that if information changes and situations change, that a person can, in fact, change his or her mind. Yeah, I, I think you're 100% correct. On the other hand, if someone is constantly changing their yes. mind, you might worry a little bit. So there, there's got to be some boundary conditions. Yes and no. Yeah. <laughs> 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 and, we, and we have seen a couple cases of presidential candidates, and this is, I think, the, the more pressing concern here, where there is wholesale change across a whole array of issues that happens somewhat spontaneously and suddenly, and it coincides with the decision to become a presidential contender right. and handle a primary within their party which has more extreme positions. So I think there is a backdrop against which that is a real thing mm -hmm. that, that reflects poor character. But more importantly, or the desire to, to win. Yeah, but, but you've got to be able to forecast what will they do when they govern. So the reason I care about this question is, yep. I do want to know when you tell me you're going to do something that there's some reasonable probability that faced with unchanged circumstances and no new information, that is in fact what you're going to do. Okay. All right, let's go to questions from the audience. You ready? Uh, historically, women running for office have been hindered by the media's focus on their appearance instead of their views. What can the academy slash the media do together to stop this? And of course, let's answer this question in light of the strong possibility, let's say, that one of the major party nominees for president next year will be a woman. And the woman gets this question? <laughs> no, I'm, I'm just looking. I'm looking down the row. You looked at me, kiddo. She, looking, she took the I'm mic. She took the I'm mic. I'm looking at you all the time, Chris. I'm less worried about coverage of appearance than about some of the other patterns of coverage of female candidates. It's there, it's a problem, but it's not what I think is the big problem. Um, I was asked by the New York Times Reader's Advocate to review Hillary Clinton's coverage after the close of her 2008 campaign because there have been accusations that the New York Times had been biased against Hillary Clinton. And so I actually systematically went back through a newspaper that I do read daily. Um, and I had already flagged some things that I was concerned about in its coverage, but it gave me the opportunity in hindsight to look back, and I flagged two things as being, I thought, more problematic than some comments about, oh, the pantsuit was blue and whatever, whatever. The first was that in the wrap-up story that the New York Times did after the candidacy was effectively over, the reporters said that Hillary Clinton had not passed the threshold to be commander-in-chief. The New York Times' own polls showed that she had passed that threshold. Now, why did they think she hadn't? And why did they think that that was a threshold that not passing was so damaging that it's written up as if it can account for the demise of the candidacy, or the lack of success for the candidacy? Because there's the assumption that that's a test for women that is different than a test for men, and because the assumption was that she wasn't able to pass it, even though the polling data suggested that she had. The reporter just hadn't gone back to look at the polls. There's some deep biases about what women need to certify in order to run that are not there for men. And when you're not aware that they're there, you write through them. You, you don't actually ask questions. So you're, the reporter was telling us something when the reporter wrote that story. The second thing I flagged was a story that focused on Hillary Clinton's cackle. 
Um, and did that because we had actually looked at Rudolph Giuliani versus Hillary Clinton as laughing human beings. <laughs> and what we had noticed was when either got an uncomfortable question, there was an awkward pause and then an awkward laugh. Now, Rudolph Giuliani had been the front runner for a period of time. Hillary Clinton was the front runner, and so we actually could pair the circumstances. So is this front runner, or is this the fact that they have a gendered stereotype about the woman's odd laugh behavior? No commentary about Rudolph Giuliani's odd laugh behavior, and not only commentary, but an entire article that uses the word cackle about Hillary Clinton, thereby eliciting which stereotypes. Those, I thought, were more problematic than appearance. And what they speak to is some deeply embedded assumptions and our language range to describe women being fundamentally different and different in kind from our language range in descri describing men. We don't have a word to characterize that is gender tied, a male's awkward laughter behavior. We're not going to go to cackle because cackle is gender tied to females in our archetypal sense of where language belongs in relationship to gender. And as a result, without the language to capture the odd Rudolph Giuliani behavior, Kenneth Burke told us something important that is revelatory here. Language does our thinking for us. We had no language. I'm not sure we even observed it. It's those kinds of patterns that are worrisome because fundamentally they disqualify the female candidate on illegitimate grounds. The, uh, the impersonation one receives on Saturday Night Live <laughs> can be very important to establishing uh, who you are in in the public's mind from you know Chevy Chase falling down as Gerald Ford to the goofy uh, uh, George Bush senior uh, to the very creepy uh, Bill Clinton um, and the the woman who now plays Hillary Clinton has been playing her for quite a while and she has acknowledged some nervousness about her characterization the cackle is a huge part of it but even more uh, striking are the crazy eyes <laughs> she does these big crazy eyes and they're they're not pulled out of the air at random, they pick up on things a candidate has done at some time and then repeat them in an SNL tedious kind of way. Um, so I think the things you're describing are going to be very powerfully foregrounded because that's going to be the Hillary Clinton that a lot of people think of when they see Hillary Clinton. Um, and I think more broadly, uh, uh, tone and emotion. We, I, I, I think you could probably come up with a whole series of examples of words and so on that will be problematic in this way. That I. I, that said, I, I worry about those differences, but boy do we have, in a sense, whether you're liberal or conservative, we have the right candidate to handle this. And that Hillary Clinton has been around so long that, you know, you have, to, you have to talk about something. And all the things that are so stereotypical about coverage have kind of been done. We know she wears a pantsuit. That's not going to be a thing, right? And so I think in a way she's, I think she's going to be able to handle that to a degree that another candidate might not because it'll be so fresh and exciting to talk about ridiculous things about them uh, that for Hillary have already been done. Although watch for the so long Hillary Clinton transformed into reinforcing age stereotypes about women. And we've, we've reinforced them about men, this is equal opportunity field, but they are different about women and they've been historically different about women. And the comment by a, a conservative radio host whom I wrote a book about that says we don't want to watch Hillary Clinton be, become more wrinkled and wrinkled as we watch uh. you know, her in the public sphere is, is on the edge of that and it's really a sharp edge. One of the, I mean, Bob Dole was attacked covertly, indirectly on age all through the campaign very effectively. It's, a, it's an attack that's out there and it's used against men as well as about women. It was used against McCain very effectively. Oh, we actually, we, very explicitly, we showed this in survey research, which you can't pick up anything that's subtle. We actually showed the effect of exposure to the age attacks in the Obama ads against McCain on perceptions of McCain's age in relationship to confidence. Watch the attack on age on Hillary Clinton and all the coded means of saying, you know, Great person, terrific, too old to be president. Let me, let me just say a couple things. First of all, um, you didn't really just say we have now the right candidate to handle that, did you? <laughs> in any case, I mean, it's, uh, anyway. I, I, I did, and I, I actually think in some ways, I, I think in some ways she is. I think in some ways Barack Obama was perfectly positioned to become the first African American okay. president. Okay. I mean, he could handle some of the okay. issues. I yeah. think she can handle some of the gender stereotypes that'll come her way. Okay. Um, but let me let me just point out a, an interesting fact, and then deal with uh, some of the sexual politics that, that are are going on. Uh, just for your interest's sake, it's kind of an opposite situation in a sense. In uh, 1984, uh, Michael Dukakis 
Uh, there was a picture of him in a tank that was, <laughs> that was, mm -hmm. that was I think, erroneously connected to his uh, losing that election because it was argued that he looked so ridiculous in the tank. There is a picture of Margaret Thatcher in a tank that, if you want to look at my book, it's in my book, the only authentic book of persuasion. It is, I, I think these two pictures are literally identical but for the person in the tank. And nobody said about Margaret Thatcher that she'd look ridiculous in the tank. Just take a look at it if you get a chance. Let me just also say about, about the, the, the sexual rhetoric and, uh, and, uh, and politics and so on. Um, one of my favorite columnists is Kathleen Parker, uh, who, is, who is not a big fan of uh, Hillary Clinton. And she said, the sole fact that a candidate's sex doesn't move me much. Would I like to see a woman president? Absolutely. Would I vote for a woman instead of a better qualified man just for the pleasure of experiencing a first woman presidency? Nope. And I, I, think, that, I think that that is the responsible uh, position uh, even for a columnist to take, that a person should not be elected for gender reasons, that that should not, be, that should not superordinate all other considerations. Uh, but, you know, and so the arguments, it's our turn, I think are going to ring less effectively with many people than uh, some Democrats think, but we'll see. Yeah, Professor Batts gave us a challenge. It's can you see past your ideology to see those things that are problematic? Sarah Palin. I would not vote for Sarah Palin. Nor would I. Sarah Palin, however, was subject to gendered stereotypes oh, yeah. and I commented publicly on it. When she is speaking at the Republican convention, and her child is in the audience being passed from the young daughter to the older daughter and then to the father. There are media commentators who said the child shouldn't be there and commented about the inappropriate fact of Sarah Palin tolerating that they never would have said that had that been a man there and had that be, been a woman there in the same role as, as, the, as the male parent. It, to the extent that all of those kinds of statements about Sarah Palin's description were highly sexualized, they added a dimension that was far different than the sexualization of the images of, of Hillary Clinton. I did an entire segment on that with Bill Moyers, complete with all sorts of visual illustrations. We need to be extremely sensitive to these kinds of things across political ideologies because fundamentally they are about disabling women for leadership not only about whom we're going to elect under one circumstances, we ought to be the same about every form of discrimination that manifests itself rhetorically in public space. That's why you should always watch major speeches on, major speeches on C-SPAN and never listen to the yeah. nattering nabobs of network journalism. Yeah. Kathleen and I are at one on this. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, both on our disdain for Sarah Palin and on how she was treated unfairly. Yeah. Um, so let's stay with Hillary Clinton for a moment and sort of turn it around the other way. Um, and you met, I mean, this is someone who's been around for a long time, oh. has records. No, well, no, that means she's experienced, right? Um, better, better. <laughs> no, but I mean, we have a lot of exposure to her for good and for ill, right? And she's done a lot of things that have been controversial, and she has a tendency to be very defensive about them in the Clintonian way of the Clintonian camp to circle the wagons and blame a vast right-wing media conspiracy for her woes. So how does, if she is the Democratic nominee for president, the press, showing that it is not in the tank for Hillary Clinton, hold her to the appropriate and normal level of scrutiny for a nominee without being subject to accusations endlessly of gender bias? Well, I mean, I think, you know, as a reporter, <laughs> I, you know, I've covered, um, we had Mayor Sheila Dixon, Mayor Stephanie Rawlings-Blake. I mean, it, 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 it just, I mean, I have to say, honestly, as a reporter, you become pretty tired of ideology fairly quickly. It, it, it's really yes, tiresome. You do. Hmm? Yes, you do. Yeah, you know, it's just after a while, the ideologies, perceptions really melt away. And, and if you're a good reporter, and I know this is really a pat answer, but the truth of the matter is if you're good at what you do, and you're thoughtful, that those issues aren't really going to surface. I know that when, our Mayor, when Mayor Sheila Dixon was, um, was indicted for uh, stealing gift cards, uh, there was a, a lot of controversy about the coverage because uh, some reporters confronted her about her wardrobe and how she bought her shoes. And I, I think, you know, as you cover a person, you cover a subject matter, you realize those issues really add nothing to, to 
your merit as a reporter or any of the reporters. So it's really up to the, the, the press in that sense. Yeah. But I'll, also, again, I have that question of why, how the press can completely be held accountable in that way, too. But I, ultimately, I think a good reporter just doesn't care about that sort of. If, if I could reframe your question, Chris. Sure. The, I, I, I think the question coming into this, this race in particular um, is, what are the kinds of questions as a reporter that we want to ask about Hillary Clinton's credentials that are going to reveal those, those, those characteristics or criteria that are relevant to the presidency? And I think the press is asking that about the Secretary of State position. It is writing stories because you know, we had many female Secretaries of State before this. That was not path-breaking to have a female Secretary of State. When the press writes the story that says, she doesn't have accomplishments as Secretary of State. We're looking at the allegation that she doesn't have accomplishments as Secretary of State. I think the question we should ask is, what are the accomplishments you would expect of a Secretary of State? A male Secretary of State, a female Secretary of State. What are the accomplishments of past Secretaries of State? Male Secretaries of State, female Secretaries of State. Because now this isn't only about the first woman, she wasn't. But you have women of both parties who have held that position. And then ask, are we setting a criteria here for Hillary Clinton that is different than a criteria we would set were there a man running for president? And if the answer is no, we know what an accomplishment looks like for a Secretary of State. We know what we would argue was an accomplished Secretary of State. And there are actual things she doesn't have that she could have had, then that's a legitimate story. If not, then the question is, is there a gendered element here? And if so, what is it? And so I think we're in the process of asking questions about new situations, not about making presumptions that there are certain categories that are always problematic. I don't think characterizing, for example, clothing is always problematic. I think sometimes it's perfectly legitimate. I worry about having these categorical statements that say, this is always bad, this is always good. Instead, ask, I think we ought to be asking, what is and is not the criteria that reveals what's relevant to governance, and are we reasonably applying it on a gender neutral basis? There was a time several years ago when I think Elizabeth Dole might have been the perfect first female uh, presidential candidate for a major party. Obviously, she didn't choose that path and so on. But I remember at the time getting in arguments with people about this question. And the one hitch for her was, well, the American Red Cross was great, but she didn't have the history in public service. And that was always going to be a problem. And it was surely one of the reasons she didn't become that candidate. The reason I, I, I keep saying I think Hillary Clinton is a great candidate for who are you going to have as the first sort of major party female candidate to advance out of the primaries and so on is I, I, I think we will have debates about Secretary of State and so on, but my gosh, you know, great record of public service, you know, pr great legal background and so on. She is in so many ways, it, she, she gets to check that box. And in terms of the reportage, I think she sets up contrast. That is, you, you have to have something to cover. And you've covered so much of the op research and so on. Now you get to talk about, well, what, is, what would she actually do as president? It's a great question that we sometimes don't quite get to. Um, so I think she gets us there faster than a lot of other candidates would. And so that's my hope for the coverage, that we really get into that policy contrast of what will those finally two major party candidates really contrast in terms of what they say they would do and, and mm. probably would do as president. I think it is perfectly legitimate to say that under Hillary Clinton's uh, serving as Secretary of State, that how, is, how has the situation changed in Benghazi, Syria, how has the situation changed with ISIS, Al-Qaeda, has, uh, has Russia been encouraged or discouraged from expansion? I think these are eminently reasonable questions. I think it was eminently reasonable questions to ask in the 80s and 90s about the status of the Cold War under Secretaries of State and under Presidents. I, I think that these are perfectly legitimate questions. And I also think that when she appears to be reticent to engage in conversations at this point in her candidacy at all, I think these are legitimate questions to raise. Yeah, and I, I think true. it should be raised. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, we haven't done a really good job in the reportorial community raising those sorts of issues about candidates in general. Mm -hmm. So I mean, what, what is it about your background that makes you better able to do this job? And specifically, I mean, they bring life experiences. What did those life experiences bring? We tend to use life experiences as a way of discrediting candidates instead of building candidacies. So I thought you could make a very strong case for Romney's managerial experience based on Bain Capital 
And you could argue that in managing the executive branch, it helps to have managerial kinds of experience. Now let's look at whether that's an accurate statement or not, whether that kind of experience actually generalizes over. I thought you could raise the question about George Herbert Walker Bush, whether his experience in China was a relevant experience to the presidency, particularly in the transitional period that we're coming through. You can raise the question, does a governorship right. help prepare you in some ways because it's executive, it's not legislative in background, and do we get fundamentally different presidents when we elect out of governorships as opposed to out of the Senate or out of the House? But we don't find a reportorial structure to look at that in a way that helps inform the debate, and I think we could use the Hillary Clinton as Secretary of State as a way to open that debate up in some important ways. I thought we had a very interesting debate in 2008 when Barack Obama said he didn't have the experience, he had the judgment. He was basically saying time in office doesn't equal what you need, judgment does, and argued I would have voted against the Iraq war. Well, of course, we don't know because he didn't. Lincoln Chafee is running. He did vote against the Iraq war, and he did oppose the Bush tax cuts. I think he can make a different kind of argument from his experience in the Senate than Barack Obama could make who hadn't actually cast those votes. And, and who was the first senator to be president in quite a while, I think since John F. Kennedy, if I'm incorrect, and he had no administrative experience. And I think those kinds of questions should be asked as well. Well, LBJ, but by different means. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, well, and when you ask the question about the president's looking back, John Kennedy had virtually no legislative record. Right. So if you say right. you have to have passed legislation, that's a sign of, that you can do something well, then you don't elect John Kennedy. Mm. I mean, his big accomplishment was an exchange program with Africa. He had his name on nothing. <laughs> his name on a book he didn't write. Um, yeah. Uh, Another question about biography. Right. The Sorensen uh, book, you mean? Pardon? Are you talking about the Sorensen book? Profiles of Courage, Profiles yes. Profiles of Courage, yeah. That's a great book. Uh, <laughs> harkening back to something that, that Richard said about his students and where they get their civic and political information, we have two questions about what are my three favorite um, television news shows. The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, The Colbert Report, and John Oliver's last week. Um, does anybody care to talk about what kind of a role um, those fake news shows that still actually become one of the main um, vehicles and or filters that a lot of people have for political information? Good, bad, I'll, I'll just say humor is serious business. I mean, no, when you, uh, I, I think that uh, one of the reasons that John Kerry lost was because supporter Seth Meyers did a, a devastating impersonation of him. And, the, you know, people talk about Saturday Night Live trending to the left. But in that year, they were pretty equal in their satire. And Seth Meyers did a devastating uh, and by the way, Seth Meyers uh, supported John Kerry, but he did a devastating impersonation of uh, John Kerry's uh, contradictions in his, in his campaign rhetoric, and I think it hurt him. And I, I think, as I say, I think hu humor is a serious business. I think that, that uh, it, it appears to be people smiling, but people are uh, making points uh, said in jest meant in earnest. Well, I know yeah, that folks. anyone who's ever covered you know, any sort of politician or any sort of governance knows that irony naturally emerges and sometimes you're frustrated as a reporter because you can't always elicit that. But that, you know, I think satire is, is a great form of accountability. It, uh, it works quite well and, and certainly, uh, you know, I have the same experience. I teach students at journalism at Towson and I have the same experience with students who pretty much the Daily Show is probably their main source of news. So. I think it's also a reflection of trying to distinguish yourself and, and the, the difficulty of distributing news in an environment that is purely social. And it's, humor is a great form of social communing. So I, I think, truthfully, it might be a model that is more effective than just natural straight news. A strength and a weakness analysis. The strength is that underlying, this was The Daily Show, and it, it certainly became true of Colbert and now John Oliver's show, is that there is an underlying presumption that we ought to live in a deliberative culture, that we ought to take uh, facts seriously, uh, that we should not permit hypocrisy, um, uh, blatant contradictions of position that aren't acknowledged and so on. Um, that, that, that's what makes it funny, is I, I, I can't stress this enough, that 
those jokes aren't funny unless you presume that we should be living in a deliberative culture. And I love that, and he celebrates that, and he tells us what the media should do. Weakness. Um, you might remember a few years ago there was a sort of big national event that Stuart and Colbert did get together in DC, and I personally could not have been more disappointed. Um, what it really showed, and I'd always feared, was that they have a great critique, and they don't know what the alternative would look like that is engaging, uh, substantive, and so on. That their alternative was a joke, not intentionally. There was one moment where Stuart had a video of traffic merging and made a really poetic statement about how people do manage in daily life to get along. Our ideology doesn't matter in so many ways, in so many moments. And it was poetic and beautiful and completely at odds with the whole rest of the event. So I think they struggle to know what comes next but they excel at critiquing the flaws in our, in our politics and our media. Have, have any of you watched Last Week Tonight yet? Yeah. yeah. I think the middle segment is as good as investigative journalism as you're going to find on TV. I mean, it's from a point of view, but it's, it's very serious journalism going on there. Well, and it, it speaks to something that we've known for a long time. Uh, during the health care reform debate of 93, 94, we content analyzed the evening news over a six-week period and compared what we learned about the substance of the health care reform initiatives to what they managed to communicate in one Saturday Night Live skit and mm -hmm. found the Saturday Night Live skit had more substantive information about the alternative plans than did the evening news. We looked at the uh, Colbert Report's uh, campaign finance moves across the creation mm -hmm. of a mm -hmm. fake committee, et cetera. Uh, with very nice survey data across that election and found that the public learned more about the intricacies of campaign finance reform. Not, not by the way, a, a, an easy issue than it had by exposure to news. The capacity of these structures to create information that lets you then do something is what news aspires to do. I wouldn't call them fake news in that way. I mean, I think they're, they're better in that capacity because they're holding attention through dull topics than the regular news is, and because when they go, they actually go deep. And that's what you're speaking to with, with the most recent. Let me make a, just a couple quick points. Um, I, have, I have always argued that, and therefore it must be true, of course, I, I've always argued that the single most persuasive kind of uh, testimony is reluctant testimony. And on these shows, which tend to trend left a little bit, when they get angry at a Democratic president, it is devastating. Mm -hmm. uh, so if, if you have a, a sense of love of reluctant testimony, people testifying against their apparent biases, uh, you can sometimes see in these shows uh, great examples. A second point I wanted to make is, is that uh, we've been talking about uh, some excellent investigative journalism, uh, and I'm going to give an opinion, and you may disagree or agree. Uh, and I also want to say that I, I know one of the people, I, I know one of the, uh, the executive director of the show, but um, I think the 60 Minutes is just the most incredible investigative show for decades and decades that I have ever seen. Every time I watch that show, I'm struck with how excellent it is. Uh, and Scott Pelley is, is uh, just, just unbelievably, unbelievably excellent in, uh, in his particular work. Sometimes there, there's a weak segment here, a weak segment there. But by and large, the quality on 60 Minutes is just really extraordinary. OK. Um, great question from the audience. Can ind change of sort of going back to sort of the middle part of our conversation. Can independent voices critical equally of both right and left emerge in a meaningful way when the two partisan, if you will, or ideological narratives seem to be the basis of the media's business model now. Um, you want me to? I mean, Whoever, <clears throat> yeah. It's a tough one. If yeah, you're going that, first, you're a brave man. Yeah. No, that is an excellent. <clears throat> I think that is the question um, that we're facing right now as, as journalists. But I, I have started working for the Real News Network, um, which is, you know, purely online, but, but you know, there is a, our, our editorial director is purely, you know, he is a person with strong opinions, and he, he, he expresses them on a regular basis. And so for me, I have like a ground sort of, but I've always sort of dealt with that internally or externally, but now the question is, you know, is that gonna be the basis for being able to do other types of journalism? And I feel like, yes, because to a certain extent, without sort of his 
Um, you know, I don't know if he's purely ideological, but his intellectual leadership, I don't know if we'd attract the donations that we do. I mean, I'm just being practical. Mm -hmm. Now, can I, can I do unbiased journalism in that format? I think, I, th I think personally I think I can, but I can see why someone would question that. And that business model has its own issues because you know, those, those types of uh, you know, biases tend to be, or you know, perspectives or whatever you want to call them, transmit through the entire news culture. But it is, you see, if we're talking about sort of uh, you know, Comedy Central being more able to deliver information, I mean, everything I've heard here um, <clears throat> constructed says that you know, the straight news coverage of the unbiased report on the beat is pretty much dead in the water. Uh, based on what I've just heard here today. Uh, so how exactly are we, if we really value that, or we think, are we, and we have that sort of conflict, this conflict I've always heard as a reporter. Well, you know, you're not relevant, but you better do a good job. And <laughs> it's sort of the type of strange, strange thing. I mean, it comes from every corner. It comes from academics, it comes from people. You know, when I was, had Investigative Voice, they started this thing called News Trust through the Open Society Institute. They, they spent $120,000 getting people to tell us that we stunk. All day, who would sit there? Which is fine, you know. We should be held accountable, but um, you know, I think that is the primary question. How how does this straight news, this report on the ground, who would really evince the kind of complexity we all think we need? How 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 does it work? And one way I see it working is through left and right sort of organizations that tend to get funded because they're left and right people are willing to support them. In that context, can unbiased journalists function? I think that's the ultimate question going forward, you know, will it work? Real quick to that point, um, how many people here have heard of a, a new media organization called New Jersey Spotlight? Couple, okay. Uh, new Jersey Spotlight, you know, largely started through foundation funding, but they do an extraordinary job of doing something that almost no major newspapers do anymore, actually covering what's going on in the state capital of New Jersey, of any state capital, but in this case, New Jersey. John Mooney is a good friend of mine. We are, we are partners with them, but we end up on a lot of news innovative panels together. Mm -hmm. And John has a line I just love. He said, I'm, I'm dedicated to trying a really unusual news innovation. It's called beat reporting. <laughs> <laughs> that is absolutely true. Yeah. That is a dinosaur. But there's no better way to understand the complexity. And I've watched him lose a half million dollars in potential funding at a meeting because the funder then started yelling at him, you know, because he was a stick in the mud and he held to his ground and lost the money. So I admire the hell out it of him. It is that. a very uh, treacherous position when yeah. you don't have any patrons. <laughs> but the, the, on, on the question, you know, can we break out of the, the two party lock and the perspective on news? The Tea Party has. Mm -hmm. I mean, there, there's been a lot of coverage of the Tea Party. Uh, the Tea Party is now a real electoral force. Now, in part, it got news coverage the way outliers tend to get news coverage by engaging in some forms of extreme behavior which tends to marginalize those, those, but it did break through, which means that it, that, that two-party perspective is not so strong that there was no space to let it come through. Well, most of the breakdowns I see show that the, you know, the breakdown in terms of ideology, the, the self-described moderates um, still have a plurality, many of them also independent and moderate. Some people are party-affiliated and moderate, and Elections, presidential elections, normally end up being about you know a battle for the hearts and minds because they're the decisive voters. If all that is true, why are they? Why don't they have their their own media or their own party or their own narrative? I mean, why are they it's, a it's, shuttlecock between the other two? It's narratives? hard to motivate reasonable people. I think you know, <laughs> you know, and to a certain extent, on that level, at least in the marketplace of ideas, maybe. You know, I, don't know. I would argue parenthetically that the single greatest destructive power in political parties might be the Tea Party, because I think the internecine fighting, where they are, where they become a single or double issue uh, people, and if you're not pure, you will lose, not, either, you will either lose their vote or lose their participation. Uh, I think this is, uh, I think this is a potential devastating hit on the Republican Party. Uh, I, I would, I would just stress that there are people, serious people, uh, overwhelmingly populate both political parties and certainly the political middle. It gets back to, do people have an appetite for accurate information? Again, referencing, always cite your source, I was taught that early, my dear spouse, when she was the news director of the community radio station in, in Madison, I alluded to before, one of the things she tried so hard to teach her volunteers, all of whom had very strong progressive political agendas, almost to a one, 
Um, she would say, that doesn't mean you can't have news values. Yes, you can cover the event that nobody else is going to cover. Go do the protest and so on, but actually cover it as a reporter. So you're making choices about what you cover, but you have to answer to me in terms of the quality of your coverage of that event. And when you're reposting things on Facebook and so on, there's a tremendous appetite for actual information. Uh, think about all the maps of the U.S. that circulate with statistics on migrant uh, populations or w whatever it might be, or interesting facts about the debt and the deficit and so on. Now, there are particular organizations that mobilize to put together facts, and as, as you pointed out earlier, there's choices about which facts to present and so on. Um, but I'm also seeing a market for uh, information that is just more complicated. What does this map really show? Well, it shows lots of things, and it needs to be interpreted and read. But again, this recirculation of almost the sort of like USA Today type infographics and, and brief discussions is a little bit heartening to me. And it reminds you that people love information. They, they want to be informed. Okay, this is a, a question that really changes topics, but I, I think it's, um, it does in fundamental ways pertain to what we've been talking about today. Um, questioner is just asking for thoughts on um, the Rolling Stone UVA rape story and how that relates to accountability in journalism, because nobody at Rolling Stone lost their job over That's that. incredible. I, I can't even believe that. that no, I, I've seen people fired in newsrooms for, for one one-hundredth less irresponsible reporting, and I think it's, it's, it's a blemish on all of journalism that no one got fired. I mean, I, I always talk about when we cover government institutions which have much more protection for their employees, that lack of accountability can lead to corruption. The fact that no one was fired is ridiculous, is utterly inexcusable. I mean, I, I can't really, you know, th th this wasn't a mistake. This was a concerted effort to misrepresent the truth, in my opinion, because they thought it would be, they thought it would be popular. And they, and, you know, there's comments from the editor, Will Dana, who said before, we're gonna do a different kind of journalism. Well, that, that to me is, I, I can't even understand. I can't well, they comment. sure achieved that objective. <laughs> yeah, <didn't> they? <laughs> so I, I think it just makes us look like every other government organization we cover where people aren't held accountable. And it's unfortunate, I don't want to see anybody lose their job, and I've seen people lose their jobs over, over 100 times less. Let, me, let me just say, uh, first of all, I, I support Stephen's uh, perspective on this 100%. Uh, while this was going on, and the Rolling Stone article was seen as the final word on the representation of, of that particular uh, claim of sexual assault, uh, I'm in my university senate, and, I, and I, they were talking about all of a sudden new rules on charges of sexual assault against students. And I said, let's not forget the presumption of innocence. And after, and, and I, I stress this, you know, not because I knew that there was not sexual uh, assault at, uh, at Virginia, but because it's a, it's a critical cornerstone of our criminal justice system. And for universities who take this up rather than let police take it up, you know, to simply ignore the, the presumption of, in, of innocence is, is an incorrect uh, position to take. And after it was over, there's a dean at, at, uh, at Towson who came up to me, God, I'd love to tell you his name, but I won't, who came up to me and said, yeah, you ought to read the Rolling Stone piece again, huh? You ought to read it, and then you'll learn that this presumption of innocence stuff is just too much, or something like that, I don't know. But the fact is, is that if you read, most people who read the Rolling Stone piece find it intuitively uh, not, it doesn't seem to go intuitively. It seems to be, it seems to be counterintuitive. It doesn't seem to, to make sense. And it's a, it's a, it was a rush to judgment because it conformed with what a lot of people thought was happening all over the country. A lot of people still think it's happening all over the country. I think it's happening all over the country, but not all over the country. And I, and I think that it's one way that we lose sight of the critical protections we have in the criminal justice system. But if you, don't, if you write about people and you don't call them, I just don't think there's, that's inexcusable. You know, there's bad no journalism. excuse for it. Just, just a point of stress. One is I, I think we're very fortunate that we have such depth of coverage of what happened at Rolling Stone. So mm -hmm. anyone who wants to know how that happened, it's tremendous analysis. Yeah, the Washington Post did a great job on yeah. that. Yeah, and, and the thing to stress, you don't, you don't have to read all that, though I encourage you to, is uh, that it really was uh, from the top down. That is, it would be a mistake to think, wow, how did this reporter get away with this? Well, there was a whole infrastructure that supported that very poor decision. So when you say, I can't believe no one was fired, I actually don't know if you mean the reporter, the you know, it, it could be a whole number well, of true, characters, true. just to stress that. Yeah. All right, to, to that point, and I mean, I thought about this a lot when the, the story was you know, in process. 
I, mean, I agree with Stephen. I can't believe no one was fired. But on the other hand, the worst thing that ever happened to me in my journalistic career was when I was editorial page editor at the Enquirer. We printed an op-ed that was as factually, it was, its premise was as factually wrong um, as the Virginia um, rape story. And it was just a complete breakdown of process and Howie Kurtz wrote about it. I really enjoyed that. Um, but the question was, like, you know, who's accountable? I mean, I told the, the person who, it, it was about um, uh, gay bashing, and um, there, it asserted that something had happened to a gay man in Philadelphia. He'd been beaten, and eventually, a long time after the beating, had died as a result of his injuries. And uh, the facts of the case were completely, there were no facts, it was untrue. Um, the writer of the piece had been told the story by someone else and had just believed it and hadn't fact checked it at all, so that's pretty bad. Um, so who do I hold accountable? I mean, I told the writer of the piece he would never write for us again, and to this day he still thinks I was mean and unfair, but do I fire the editor who edited the piece or do I resign? You know, I mean, I'm ultimately accountable, and that's why I told Howie Kurtz there was a breakdown of editorial process, so I'm the guy. Um, but, but you know, you know and, and you get to the whole I got mouths to feed thing, and I've had a great career, and this is the worst thing that ever happened to me. So it's, it's more complicated. I totally agree someone should have lost no, their job, but right. it's always harder inside than it is outside no, to I've, say heads should roll. I've watched it happen, so I know it's easy to say yeah. from this position, well, someone's got to be fired, and, you know, I've watched it happen, and I've, and I've you know, been involved in things, and so, no, it is always much more difficult on a personal level. I, I, I understand that. I do. No, no, I know you do. And yeah. I completely agree with you that somebody should have been fired. But it's yeah. just, it's always, whenever anything goes wrong in an organization, outside voices, and I, you know, I was an editorial yeah. writer. That's one of the, you know, the yeah. core editorial writer moves. You know, someone must pay for this. <laughs> right. But it's always a lot more complicated inside right. an organization than, than on the outside. But the, the other thing that one should say about this is sometimes the, the institutional structure is strong enough that you find your mistakes, and sometimes it's not strong enough and you don't. In the process of worrying about what wasn't done, let's remember that there was very good journalism that uncovered the very bad journalism and exposed the problems, and the journalistic community is now debating what it could have done differently. And even if one outlet doesn't do what some people might think, it doesn't mean that this isn't a chastening experience for the journalistic enterprise or the journalistic enterprise has failed. It hasn't. It engaged in a form of self-correction that suggests the journalism is in fact alive and well. Right. Yeah. One advantage of the fragmentation of media uh, is that these things cannot go on when they are blatantly false without being discovered. And so I think that that's one, that's one advantage uh, of uh, uh, if there are economic disadvantages, that's, mm -hmm. that's one no, substantive true. advantage. It's true. Okay, here's a question for the audience. It's directed first at you, Richard, and we sort of revisit, in, in a sense, we're revisiting some of our earlier discussion, but it may be worth doing. So do you vo voice red reticence, I think that's, the hand raised a little hard, do you voice reticence about the idea that, about the subjective nature of journalism, and particularly you mentioned the, the old phrase, afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. Yeah. But the questioner, this is the questioner, um, doesn't pure objectivity per se actually reinforce the status quo and therefore comfort the comfortable and afflict the afflicted? Well, no, I, I don't think there is such a thing as objectivity. We're not objects. Uh, we all go through the, all of our information goes through a prism and it goes through psychological prisms and personal prisms and, and so I think, I think that there is no such thing as objectivity. There is, there is, uh, I forget who first said this, uh, there is fairness. And I, I think you, you try to, to get a bird's eye view for uh, tending to agenda and spin. And agenda and spin is everything in, uh, in journalism. And you try to be as fair as possible. When you, when you talk about com comforting the afflicted and afflicting the comfortable, uh, you're talking about a journalistic process which, which says these people are, are not enjoying life as much as these people, so let's, make it, let's find some information that makes it easier for them. And people who are comfortable in society, which I assume very often means the wealthier members of society, uh, let's, let's attack the plutocracy. Let's, let's ensure that, that uh, the rich are paying more taxes and, and the wealthier are paying more taxes. I mean, it just to have a clear agenda as a journalist seems to me to be contradictory to being an authentic journalist. So let me uh, reframe the question, this would be generally. Um, do, you, do any of you still believe in the idea of one of the missions of journalism being the watchdog mm -hmm. of government and power or the cop on the beat? Yes. 
Yes. That, that's the, one of the core missions. Um, and I, I believe it's one of the most important, and anybody who's engaged in it knows how important it is. Because you know, government can really run on its own and really has no self-correcting tool necessarily uh, that can be removed from that political process. So really, like if we want to be practically useful to the public at large, the role of a watchdog or the role of you know holding government accountable is actually pretty much it. I mean, there are a lot of things we can do, and we talk and we debate about a lot of things of like you know perception and how we characterize a candidate or something. But that particular role um, is is fundamentally important. And you look in Baltimore, um, you know, and you can say on some level of what has happened with the recent death of Freddie Gray is that we didn't do our job mm -hmm. as a, as watchdogs because you know policing was allowed to continue or this conflict between the community without being fully understood in its all its complexity. Uh, um, so, you know, I think absolutely, number one purpose. All right, so let me follow up, and I will fully confess to being argumentative now. It'll be up to Richard to determine whether I'm being persuasive. Uh, or authentic. So, or authentic. Uh, <laughs> so if you have a situation where a particular um, side of the ideological argument is in power for a sustained period of time, 15 or 20 years. Um, and we're used to, you know, a lot of our conversations have been about Washington and Washington politics. The fact of the matter is we have that situation in Philadelphia. I assure you, having been a journalist in Philadelphia for 26 years, I've written infinitely more critical words about Democrats than Republicans. Mm -hmm. Because you know who's always screwing up? It's the Democrats, because mm -hmm. they're in power. Um, but when you're looking at national politics, isn't it possible that you can create a narrative about bias against a certain ideology or party simply because they're in power for a long period of time? Journalists exist to watchdog and critique the performance of government, so it's very easy for people who support the government in power to say, oh look, you're being biased, you're always criticizing us. We're always criticizing us because you're always in charge. Yeah, I mean, I think it comes with power, comes that responsibility, and I, I don't think, I don't think, you know, obviously Baltimore has been democratic since, mm -hmm. I don't know when, um, uh, the 50s or something, so I, I think that just comes with power, and, and I don't think at all it, it, it gets in the realm of bias, because I don't think we really should recognize party affiliations when it comes to, you know, trying to figure out what government is doing. And, and you know, I saw that in, in Baltimore because we, we had this issue front and center, the issue of zero tolerance, which many people say was what led up to these problems with police. And I covered it extensively, and it wasn't covered in some of the other media outlets that were a little more inclined to the person who was in power who was a Democrat at that point and who had a national career and who has had a national career since then. So I, I think, um, I just don't think it should even come into the mix, and I don't, I don't, I, I never see, you know, I've never really thought of it in that realm, and it, it doesn't, it, but it, it infiltrates my thing, but no, I don't think it, I don't think you can be biased as government, they're in power. Okay, this, this would be our last comment, because we have to wrap up. Just quickly, I want to make the case for objectivity as distance. Um, that we have one kind of media we haven't talked about much is local, very local media, um, you know, community newspapers and so on, very much engaged in boosterism. There is a subjective point of view. In other words, I would argue that the status quo has a much deeper and more powerful subjectivity attached to it. It is shot through with all these assumptions. If the job of a journalist is to keep stepping back, keep trying to have perspective neutrality in that broad sense as an aspiration, it can powerfully challenge, and in some cases will be the only thing that challenges the status quo. Okay, and on that note, we thank all of our panelists, John Gastel, Kathleen Hall Jamerson, Stephen Annis, and Richard Vatz for their wonderful contributions today. And we thank you all for being here. And am I turning it over to anybody at the end, Angie? You want to come? I'd just like to echo that. Thank you. What a wonderful panel. What a wonderful way to spend a Sunday morning. Thank you so much, Chris, for moderating. We're really honored that you could join us. We still have some breakfast in the back, so please enjoy yourselves. Travel safely home, and thank you for coming to this wonderful event this morning.